Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you as well, as everybody else said, for attending um, this uh, seminar, which, as Rosalind pointed out at the start, uh, educating stakeholders, educating landlords and tenants is what's vital going forward to bring down the level of disputes uh, that come before the RTB, which is 1 to 2% of registered tenants, tenancies uh, within the jurisdiction. Um, as Owen uh, indicated, Keith Underwood from Eversheds, um, we're the advisors to the RTB and uh, during my time working with the RTB and Eversheds time working with the RTB, uh, the complexities of the 2004 Act and the 2015 Act which has just come in, um, it, it, you have to deal with it on a daily basis. It is quite a complex piece of legislation. There's been extensive judicial comment about um, how complex the legislation is and unfortunately um, as a technical piece of legislation, it doesn't really bode well for an exciting presentation. Um, you kind of, it's not the presentation you're gonna have you on the edge of your seats when we're dealing with it. And, and what we'll try and do is get through, as Tom said at the beginning, the technical aspects of the legislation in a, in a kind of a straightforward enough manner as, as we can. Uh, and then we have the Q&A session at the end uh, after Jeanette's and we're more than happy to answer the questions as best we can. Um, I think uh, I say as best we can is because we don't have a monopoly on interpretation. Um, we have been dealing with the Act for a very long time and the positions that we've reached have been as a result of quite um, detailed consideration over the years um, and advices from stakeholders and input from stakeholders and from uh, our Eversheds and Senior Council and what have you. Um, so over the next few slides, what I'd first of all like to do is just to go through the rights and obligations um, because I think it's very important, obviously, that we remind ourselves of the rights and obligations that we have. And I think what that will do is uh, ease us into the more technical aspects of the 2015 changes that were introduced. Um, just, uh, Tom said at the beginning as well, that the technical nature of it, I think, um, while we might criticize it in a sense and kind of moan that it's a very technical and it's very difficult to get to grips with um, what should be contained in a notice and, and what uh, specific um, uh, disputes might arise due to whatever types of breaches. It is important as well that it is strong and it is robust. You have a landlord's asset, extremely valuable asset, and you have a tenant's home. So it's extremely vital that you have a, a robust regulatory background to support and, um, and defend both of those equal but competing, in a sense, uh, rights. So just to move on to general rights and obligations, um, as Owen had gone through uh, the 2015 Act, um, you can now change your, uh, uh, the rent can be varied up or down uh, once every two years. So these are the landlord's rights, um, of course, to receive rent on the day it is due, and that's absolutely vital. Um, you have, a landlord has a right to end a tenancy within the first six months um, without uh, providing a reason unless uh, it is a fixed term tenancy and I'll come to termination of fixed term ten tenancies uh, later on. Uh, a landlord is absolutely entitled to know the identity of the occupants who are um, in, the, in the property and in relation to that, they're entitled to either grant or uh, withhold a request for a sublet or assignment. So subletting whereby the tenant uh, uh, temporarily releases their rights in relation to uh, the dwelling with the intention of coming back and assignment where the tenant uh, actually assigns their entire beneficial rights with no intention of returning to the property. Um, a landlord is entitled to uh, inspect the premises periodically and of course that should be done with some form of notice time dates uh, agreed in advance just to keep all the parties happy and of course then access to the RTB's dispute resolution service as a result of uh, the 2004 Act and that came into existence. So for obligations, um, now there are a number of obligations which arise under other parts of uh, other enactments and, uh, and not only the 2004 Act but a landlord is obliged to register the tenancy uh, to provide a tenant with a record of payments, um, to provide a point of contact um, for tenants, including uh, agent if the agent has been used, uh, repair, replace, and maintain the dwelling, which is uh, 
in accordance with the minimum standards regulations that are in existence. Uh, we have the new obligation in re relation to rent review, so your 90-day rent review period, um, and also to provide, as I said, prior notice of any intended uh, inspection. Um, of course, a landlord is entitled to terminate the tenancy, but it must be done in accordance with the provisions in the Act and in accordance with the new provisions in the 2015 Act. Um, refund deposits promptly, less any deductions. This is, the word promptly is actually set out, that's the word that's used in the Act. So that is an obligation, of course, lest any lawful deductions or if, there, if a dispute follows in relation to it. Um, to reimburse for reasonable and vouch expenses, um, which would ordinarily be the landlord's obligation. And if there's a management company in a multi-unit development to kind of liaise with any management company in respect of any complaints a tenant might have. And then third party obligations. So this is, uh, relates to um, your obligations to enforce the obligations of the tenant in respect of third parties, so neighbors and uh, those who reside in the, vicin the general vicinity. Uh, on tenants' rights, um, they have <coughs> the right to minimum standards. Again, relates back to the minimum standards regulations and the accommodations good condition. Um, the security of tenure that Owen discussed, after six month occupation, you have a part four tenancy in existence. And one of the key aspects of the 2004 Act was uh, the enshrining the right to peaceful and exclusive occupation of the dwelling. So again, unannounced visits just are not permitted. That would be deemed a breach of a landlord's obligations uh, to impact upon a tenant's exclusive and peaceful occupation of the property. Um, the right to contact details, not just the agent details. So this, this actually comes from the rent book regulations. Um, so uh, the actual landlord and the agent's contact details, not, so sorry, not just the agent contact details, should be provided. Um, a tenant is entitled to a record of all the payments that they've handed over, including details of the deposit. So uh, that, that's, that has to be said out. Um, and again, as we said in the 2015 Act, now you have your 90-day notice of review and a review every 24 months at market rate subject to the exceptions. The ex exceptions being that uh, if the property is subsequently sub uh, kind of um, renovated to a standard which would mean an increase in actual market rent available for that property as opposed to what it was uh, prior. And of course, access to the RTB's <coughs> excuse me, dispute resolution service. So these are the, uh, the general tenants' rights which are set out uh, in the Act. Um, in relation to obligations then, it is to pay the rent on the date it is full due. Landlord is received to pay the rent on the date it is full due. That is set out in the Act and to pay any charges that might arise in the lease or agreement. <coughs> and importantly, if there is a dispute, a tenant is obliged to continue to pay the rent during the carriage of that dispute, if it's before the, the, the RTB, until the dispute comes to an end, and to pay any other charge that might arise. So that's an important point to have set out. Um, keep the dwelling in a good condition and do not cause damage. Of course, that is uh, extremely important. And there are uh, cases that might come before the RTB alleging above um, normal wear and tear. But on the flip side of that, you have to take into account the actual occupants, the duration, the type of normal wear, uh, wear and tear. So whether it's beyond wear and tear, but uh, generally the uh, obligation is to keep the property in a good condition and not cause damage. Um, the tenant has to allow the landlord or the agent access to the property for periodic inspections, uh, date and time to be agreed, and also to allow access for repairs if that is required. Um, one of the big ones obviously, of course, is the uh, tenant is not is obliged not to get involved in any antisocial behaviour or to have to allow others such as visitors or other occupants of the property to in engage in antisocial behaviour. And <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Act uh, defines what is antisocial behaviour. I won't obviously go into the whole uh, huge definition of it, but basically it's acts that might uh, be deemed the commission of an offence or that put a party, say a neighbour or someone in the vicinity in fear or harassment or damage or injury, that type of stuff, and uh, other acts that uh, might be deemed a, a persistent breach of, say, a neighbour's uh, peaceful occupation of their property. So that would be an obligation that the tenant has to adhere to. Um, let's see. 
not to assign sublets. So I was mentioned what, a, what, what an assignment of a tenancy is, and I mentioned what a subletting of a tenancy is. So uh, if this was to occur, the landlord's consent is required. So they're not allowed to do that. Uh, the landlord is entitled to withhold their consent. Um, that's at their discretion in relation to a request by a tenant to do either or. Um, but, but if it is a fixed term tenancy, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, address it in a later slide, um, the uh, withdrawal or refusal to grant consent can entitle a tenant to terminate a fixed term tenancy, but we'll look at that in a while. Uh, again, not to alter or improve without any written consent, um, to only use the dwelling as a dwelling and not to use it as a business unless the landlord consents to uh, some form of a business operating out of the actual property, and uh, to notify the landlord in writing uh, of all those who are resident in the property and of course to provide a valid notice of termination is something that's kind of forgotten but if a tenant technically does have to, it, it's, it says a tenancy should be terminated so it's applicable to both landlords and tenants, the tenant should uh, terminate in a particular way. Um, just before I move on to the kind of changes as well that came in with the 2015 Act, this is an Act that came in on the 1st of January which relates to uh, equality legislation and it, it is inserts a new discriminatory ground um, under the Equal Status Act. So it basically, it's called the Housing Assistance Ground. Uh, it came in on the 1st of January. And basically what it says is that you cannot discriminate um, a, someone who's looking to, to, to take up a tenancy. You cannot discriminate on the basis that you have one person who is in receipt of some form of a social welfare, social protection payment as against somebody who's not. That's a ground for discrimination, so it's something to be extremely uh, cognizant about. Um, kind of uh, non-workplace <laughs> discrimination uh, relief that's actually underneath the Equal Status Act, which is the workplace, uh, which I think went into the Workplace Commission in October of last year. But if it's a tenancies, we'll talk about it later on. Uh, but again, discrimination against a person in receipt of some kind of a, a social protection payment is no longer, um, not that it's no longer, it is now a, 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 a particularized uh, form of discrimination following this coming into uh, existence in January. Um, of this year. Um, so as I said, I'll move on to the new ending of uh, uh, tenancy requirements and try not to be uh, too technical about it. Um, <coughs> the first thing that has to be remembered is that there are certain specific requirements set out in the Act as to why, what should be contained within a notice of termination. And these six are uh, the specifics that must be set out. Um, so and actually in the Act it says these are shall provisions, so they must be set out. So it must be in writing, so um, oral or, or text uh, notice of termination isn't, uh, isn't a valid notice. Uh, signed by the landlord um, or the tenant, if the tenant is issuing the notice, and, uh, and or their authorised agent. It should obviously specify the data service. Um, and if the tenancy is for six months or more, state the reason as to why the tenancy is being terminated. So that's your section 34 grounds, as we call them. It must specify the termination date, so that's the day on which it will terminate, including the month and the year, and confirm that the tenant has the whole of 24 hours in which to vacate possession. And then if a tenant is entitled to dispute uh, the validity or the right of the landlord to serve it, the notice must set out that that, that uh, right is there and that they should refer their case to the uh, RTB within a period of 20 days of receipt of the notice. Owen mentioned earlier the new slip rule provision, um, so I'll, I'll deal with kind of both together in a few minutes, but basically the slip rule says that um, a slip or omission uh, within a notice won't necessarily invalidate the notice. Uh, but the specifics of how the slip or omission will work will really depend on the facts. So it's something that I'll look at now in a few moments. But in respect of what a notice of termination looks like and for it to be valid, it has to contain these uh, constituent parts. Um, so notice periods, what we have here is when the, um, the act was signed on the 4th of December and you had three, uh, they were kind of called rent certainty measures that were introduced on that 4th of December, the 90-day notice period, the 24-month uh, period between reviews, and a pro-rata extension on your uh, uh, notice of termination periods. 
in line with your actual occupancy of the property. So before uh, the 4th of December, the notice periods capped at uh, 112 days where a landlord is serving, and as you can see, it has been extended down on both sides of the aisle, if you want to call it that, um, to 100, sorry, 224 days, which is just over seven and a half months uh, for a landlord to, to provide notice to a tenant who has been in occupation for eight or more years, and 112 days where the tenant is the one serving the notice. Um, the thing that should be remembered, and I have, it's just there at the top, um, day one of the notice period begins on the day after you serve it. So that should always be taken into account. You should be cognizant of that, that that's important. And um, whilst it's not a, um, specifically required in the Act, it is kind of prudent to, to give an extra couple of days in case, just in terms of calculations, it's not required, but it kind of makes, makes sense to avoid any uh, issues down the line. And we have there the RTB. The RTB use express posts when they're you know, providing hearing notification letters, when they're um, uh, serving any reports that come from a dispute or serving or uh, delivering any order that might arise from a dispute. So the RTB used express post, and that will provide you with a receipt. And it doesn't require a, um, a signature like a registered post might require. So just to um, look at some common mistakes which the RTB do see in terms of uh, what arises uh, when notice periods, or sorry, when notice of termination are being delivered, insufficient notice being given, and as I said out, you know, a, a day or two, um, in, it may not be um, a, a major thing uh, when you're serving your notice of termination, but if you're the other side, the wrong side of it, it it's an invalid notice straight away. Uh, again, not signing your notice or um, um, dating it. Um, now, the slip rule will, may take care of some of these uh, uh, in terms of the dating part of it, perhaps. 14-day um, warning letter for rent arrears. So there's a two-step process, which I'll look at in a second. There's a two-step process for terminated tenancy for rent arrears, the first step being the 14 days. Uh, you have to actually allow that 14 days to expire um, before uh, a t notice of termination is served. Uh, omitting the wording at the very end, which I refer to, the, the, the right of the tenant to, to challenge um, within a period of uh, 28 days. Omitting that wording will deem a notice invalid and not setting out the additional requirements in the section 34 and 35. So e even prior to the 2015 Act coming into existence, which sets out greater requirements uh, to terminate a tenancy under a part four tenancy under those grounds, um, the RTB were, were seeing even before the, the Act came into existence that th those requirements weren't set out in notices and hence they were leading to uh, notices being deemed invalid and um, delays occurring. So the RTB have a, a vast array of different types of notices of termination on the website. Um, so they're all available for download um, and, uh, and, and use by whomever requires them. Um, Let's move on to, see, it's, it is pretty technical, it's not very, um, as I said, edge of the seat stuff. So ending the tenancy for rent arrears, um, this relates solely to a part four tenancy. Um, so you have a, a two-step process. The first step is your 14-day warning letter, uh, and it should provide a reasonable time. So this is what a tenant is entitled to receive, a landlord is entitled to deliver. It's a 14-day warning letter which says to the, to the tenant, you have breached your obligations, your breach of obligations is your failure to pay rent and giving you 14 days to discharge that rent. Um, we hold the view that the, the 14 days is, is the minimum requirement, but um, uh, this, this came from a, rec a high, sorry, the County High Court case where uh, the Judge Lafoy said that uh, 14 days would be the minimum, but even in relation to the 14 days, that might not be sufficient depending on the circumstances of the case. So we would, we would say certainly in our interpretation that 14 days is the minimum requirement to remedy the breach of obligations of failure to pay a rent. Um, and I've said out there, the, the onus is on the landlord to ensure that that is a reasonable period of time and that is enough time to remedy the breach. If that breach isn't remedied, it's a 28-day notice terminating the, uh, terminating the tenancy. So that's ending the tenancy for rent arrears, which is a part four tenancy for rent arrears. <coughs> so in relation to a fixed-term tenancy, um, if 
this, well, this says ending a fixed term tenancy, but this slide actually doesn't relate to the terminating part of it. The next slide does, but uh, let's say most tenancies are 12 month fixed term leases. That's nearly what we always see. So if after six months, whilst that person has a fixed term tenancy, they also have a part four tenancies that run in tandem. If a, par if a part four tenant wishes to remain in occupation past the kind of the end of the fixed term, whatever that fixed term should be, it's incumbent on the tenant to let the landlord know that. And they should do that uh, not later than one month and not sooner than three months before the fixed term expires. Now, if they don't do that, it's not a ground for terminating the uh, tenancies. But if, if they don't do it, the landlord's option is to recoup any losses that they may have suffered as a result of the, of the tenant, simply not telling them what their intention were, was. And uh, the types of losses I would have in my mind would be advertising, uh, re retaining an agent, that type of stuff. So if they're those kind of out-of-pocket type expenses that they'd be entitled to recoup uh, if the tenant uh, doesn't notify the landlord of their intention. <coughs> um, in ending the fixed term tenancy, which is also part four tenancy, which has to be uh, uh, remembered, there's only specific uh, conditions in which it can be terminated, um, breach of obligations by either party. So either the landlord or tenant has a breach of obligations. Um, the other second one then is, as I was talking about earlier on about uh, subletting and assignment. Uh, if a tenant wishes to leave, let's say the tenant gets uh, a job in, in another jurisdiction or m moves uh, from Cork to Dublin, what have you, they wish to uh, assign or sublet their tenancy, they'll contact the landlord to give the name of the person that they're uh, intending to assign to or sublet to. If it's a fixed term tenancy and the landlord doesn't wish for that to happen, uh, the tenant will be entitled to terminate that lease on the basis that that uh, consent has been withheld. And the third ground, uh, or condition, I think I should call it rather than ground, the third condition is uh, where the actual lease provides for specific grounds to terminate the lease, uh, terminate the fixed term tenancy, and those specific conditions aren't in contravention with the Act. And usually that basically is the Section 34 grounds that are contained within the Act, the um, uh, intending to sell, renovate, and um, change the use or take up occupation, those type of grounds, which, which I will look at now in a few moments. Um, just before I move on, I'll just check. No, I think that's it for that. So the new, these are the new notice of termination requirements, which, um, so they kind of came in in two parts. You had, um, not in two parts, but it was at the start of April that they came in. The changes to what are called the Section 34 grounds. Um, oh, sorry, before I go on to that, actually the slip rule, uh, uh, I'll talk to that first. Um, before I go on to actual the changes that came into effect, uh, expanding the requirements that, that would be set out, the statute declaration, the statements, those types of requirements that will be needed in the notice. Um, the slip rule came in, uh, which says, um, a minor slip or omission in a notice will not actually invalidate the notice if that minor slip, sorry, doesn't say, if that slip or omission doesn't prejudice the notice uh, in a material way and the notice itself is in compliance uh, with the Act. So you saw earlier on that we had uh, the notice of termination requirements, the seven, six, seven that have to be set out, the, you know, signed and dated and uh, refer dispute. These are the statutory mandatory requirements to be set out in notice of termination. So the slip or omission, it'll be interesting to see how tho those two interplay uh, as disputes go through the RTB. Um, so what you have is, um, it's kind of going to be based on the facts of each particular case. What amounts to a slip? What amounts to uh, an omission? Um, the way I, I approach it is that a, a slip in a sense might be an error in a date, so for example, um, you send a notice of termination in March, the person has been in occupation for uh, less, than the, less than four years, say, so uh, the notice period, whatever it is, 96 or 112 days, um, that'll terminate in August. So say you get the 1st of September, but you don't actually put in 2016. I think that uh, it would be quite difficult to, uh, to say that that is, a notice that materially prejudices the content. Sorry, that that is a slip that materially prejudices the content of the notice. And you know, 
I would approach that from being something that um, that uh, wouldn't uh, prejudice the uh, tenant um, before uh, a dispute that's before the RTB. I think that that's something that, that that's the type of thing in terms of a slip or omission. Omission is kind of goes to intent as into what your intent was in relation to the content of the notice. But it, you know, it really is going to depend on the facts. Um, in my experience in working with the RTB and uh, in dealing with kind of queries that have arisen, we haven't had too many of these in terms of the slip of omission because the slip of or omission, um, uh, the slip or omission uh, change has only recently come in. So it'll be interesting to see how these progress as we go through uh, the rest of the year. Uh, and as I said, the notice itself must otherwise be in compliance with the Act. So that will be, as I say, interesting to see how we uh, how it progresses through the dispute resolution process of the RTB. So uh, I'll move on now to the, the changes to the notice of termination. So these are the changes that were introduced in terms of basically statutory declarations and statements that have to accompany a notice. And these are the real, the technical changes that came in um, very recently. So at part four, tenancy um, can only be terminated under certain grounds. So you can see I've been set out there. So the breach of obligations ground, the tenant has to be provided with an opportunity to remedy the breach, um, as we pointed out in terms of terminating a tenancy for rent arrears. Um, you have the ground where the dwelling is no longer suitable to the uh, accommodation needs or other persons residing in the property. You have the landlord's intention to sell the property ground within a period of three months. And you have uh, the landlord requires the property for their own use or family member application, uh, sorry, family member occupation. Um, that ground isn't applicable to the approved housing body sector, obviously. Um, you have the landlord intends to substantially refurbish or renovate the dwelling, and then the landlord intends to change the use of the dwelling. So they're the grounds that you can use to terminate a part four tenancy. Uh, and, and apart from the first one, um, they've all had some form of, of change attached to them. So what I propose to do is, uh, I'm nearly actually towards the end of it, um, so what I propose to do is kind of just go through each, each one of those grounds and let you know what each change is set out and is applicable to them. <laughs> So for the accommodation needs ground, and I hope I won't get too technical or, or repetitive about it. So the accommodation needs ground, the notice seeking to rely on this ground has to be accompanied by a statement. And that statement <laughs> needs to specify the bed spaces uh, in the dwelling and the grounds on which the person serving the notice uh, says that the dwelling is no longer suitable, having regard to the bed spaces, the size and composition of the actual household that's in occupation. And uh, the statement for this ground is a, a mandatory requirement. Um, the intention to sell ground. So this is actually a statutory declaration requirement that is to accompany the notice. And this is a statutory declaration must confirm that it is the landlord's intention to enter into an enforceable agreement to transfer to another for full consideration the whole of their interest in the property. That's the content of what the statute declaration uh, must contain. Now, a recent High Court decision did confirm that the, the notice itself, the time frame of three months, must be set out in the notice itself. So if your notice simply said, I intend to sell uh, the dwelling at X, uh, that wouldn't be sufficient. It would have to say, I intend to sell the dwelling within a period of three months of the, determina of the termination of the uh, tenancy. So that's a very important that the three months entitlement must be set out. And the reason for that is to provide all parties, including obviously the tenant, with clarity. So they know that if this property isn't sold within three months, and if the, uh, let's say the, in the intention wasn't bona fides, that they have that three month time period when they have some clarity and they know that if, um, if that's not done, then they have recourse to the Act uh, in respect of it. And again, <coughs> excuse me, the statute declaration is a mandatory requirement. Um, the own and family occupation ground. So here you have, again, another statutory declaration. And um, this, as I said, isn't a ground that's applicable to the uh, approved housing body rental sector. So the declaration has to specify the intended documents. Um, the, these notices all had to kind of do this. They just now have to be accompanied by statements or statute declarations. So here the statute declaration has to confirm the 
occupant's identity. If they're not the landlord, they have to set out who is attending, who is occupying, so which family uh, member is occupying, and the expected duration of the occupation that also has to be set out. Uh, they have to confirm within the notice that uh, the tenant has the first option to relet um, should the property become available for reletting within a period of six months. And it's a period of six months from the termination date and the notice, or if there's a dispute, the period of six months from when the um, RTB determination order issues. Uh, again, a mandatory requirement, and as I said, not applicable to the um, approved housing body sector. <coughs> the second to last ground, the substantial refurbish or renovate ground. Uh, this actually probably one of the biggest changes for this ground, um, particularly the uh, the six-month relet option, the six-month relet option that you have to offer to the tenant, that wasn't included in the 2004 Act, so that's been reconfirmed in the 2015 Act. Um, here, it's not a statute declaration; it's a statement that uh, actually was contain or be accompanied by. So your notice must contain or be accompanied by the statement, and the statement has to set out what the works are. It has to uh, provide a copy of plan permission if plan permission is needed, uh, provide a copy of that, and if plan permission isn't required, it needs to set out uh, the name of your, the builder, the contractor, if there's a builder or contractor used, um, the dates the works will be carried out and the proposed duration, that all has to be set out in the notice. Um, so this, this is, as I said, this uh, was one of the bigger changes in terms of providing the planning permission and also setting out the six month relet option. And the final ground is the change of use ground. Um, again, here it's a statement, and the statement is to specify again what the intended use will be. Uh, obviously changing from a, a residential dwelling to a dwelling of some business operating out of it. Um, where planning permission is uh, required to provide a copy, um, and if the works are, if works are required to change the use, again, to set out the name of the builder, the expected duration, that type of stuff. And of course, to set out, should it become available for residential reletting um, within a period of six months to also set out that uh, six month option. Um, I'm sorry if that's been pretty <laughs> difficult to listen to. It's very, it's very technical. Um, and as I say, it's not edge of the seat type stuff, but, uh, these are the changes. This is what we have uh, to operate under. This the conditions that we have to operate under the environment that's now currently in place. Um, so I hope that was of some some benefit. Um, these slides are available if anybody needs the slides, and also uh, we're going to be here for the Q and A. So just a, a summary of, of what the changes came in. Um, <clears throat> before I wrap up, you have your 24-month period, as I said, between reviews. Um, the 12 months for approved housing body sector, uh, that's dependent on uh, the content of the tenancy agreement. Um, if, there's not th if there's no reference to a rent reviews in an approved housing body tenancy agreement, then the parties can uh, seek a review themselves. Um, the 90 day rent review notice, as Owen discussed, um, the pro rata extension on time periods as uh, applicable to your uh, occup actual occupation of the dwelling. The new, very technical, detailed requirements on, on ending a Part 4 tenancy, the slip rule, the free mediation, which has been a great success. Um, I know that um, Jeanette and, and we'll go into it in detail, and Rosalind has set out, it's been a huge success for the RTB. Uh, the 10-day cooling off period, which has been a change, so this is for mediations and agreements that might be reached at an adjudication, it's a 10-day cooling off period. And of course, the approved housing bodies are now uh, within the remit of the Residential Tenancies Board. And that's me. Thank you very much.